Uh, but maybe we'll just start talking and I do a little bit of um, housekeeping remarks until they join us. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for, for having me. My name is Florian Eder. I work with Politico in, in Berlin nowadays. That's all new. Uh, I did our daily newsletter playbook for three and a half years and am now here, new to this town, to uh, help expand our presence here during the next year. Uh, and I'm also new to uh, this beautiful group as a new member of the ECFR Council. So thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure being here. As I said, I'm only a bit lengthy at the beginning uh, because we still have 10 minutes to fill until our guests were told that we would start this session. Uh, but let me introduce um, who we are waiting for. We are uh, going to be joined by Jutta Urpilainen, the European Commissioner for International Partnerships and the Global Gateway Initiative. So that is really very topical because she had her big uh, moment of stardom uh, only very recently in the European Commission's press room. We are also waiting for Jose Manuel Alvarez, who is, uh, of course, Spain's foreign minister. And with me here on stage is Ivan Krastev, the chair of the Center for Liberal Strategies, who you know, of course. Thank you very much. Um, Perfect. Uh, we are going to discuss the EU's relative uh, global power in this new environment that we were just uh, given an, an introduction to, uh, together with my three guests. And I would invite you to make this an interactive session, actually, and to uh, ask questions. The people here in the room can ask questions uh, over the microphones. One's here, and one is uh, at the back, and the people watching our live stream, which is, I think, another reason why I have to restart uh, when people are told today that this starts, uh, can ask their questions also, and I will see them here. Of course. Okay. So, we're going to see a film first. That's always a good start. As global competition spreads across previously unseen terrains and the unipolar world of American dominance fades, Europeans see a new Cold War between the United States and China unfolding. But this new confrontation has a twist. Most Europeans do not feel that their own states, but rather Brussels, is the actor in the new Cold War. Why is this? The positive interpretation is that people are finally recognizing the existence and the need of a common European foreign policy. But another interpretation could be that the EU allows member states to retire from foreign policy and concentrate solely on their economic interests. Brussels, in the meantime, is tasked with defending European values and demonstrating toughness. What are the tools that the EU has at its disposal? What mixture of diplomacy, development and defence would be needed? But also, what ambition is there in reality for such more muscular foreign policy? These are the questions Europe and ECF are grappling with, and we will be very happy to hear your thoughts on them. Online, do people happen to know? Well, not yet, apparently. Um, I guess we just, they are there, yeah? And can I see them?
I will have to leave uh, at about uh, a quarter to two or two because I have to attend the Summit of Democracy with the President. Uh, welcome. First of all, welcome. Uh, Jose Manuel Alvarez, the Spanish Foreign Minister, uh, and for the time constraints that you just mentioned, uh, I would like to, to start with you, actually, and um, uh, Commissioner Opilainen will join us in due course, I think. So again, uh, officially, uh, welcome to this first session of the ECFR's Council meeting. We are discussing the EU's global power, the EU's relative global power, to be precise, uh, with Minister Alvarez, with Ivan Krasnev, who's here on stage next to me and with Commissioner Jutta Opilainen uh, from the European Commission who's going to join us in a second. Uh, Minister, let me start with you. Uh, I don't know whether you could have, whether you had an, a chance to, to have a look at the power atlas that we here in the room were just presented with. But one of the findings was... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but there is a... It's impossible to hear because there is a German translation that overlaps on your English, and I cannot hear anything. I only hear the German translation. Uh, that is good in it's case you are a German speaker, but maybe somebody can switch that off, or I can speak in German. No. <laughs> is it better now? Perfect now. I'm just ah, super. here to I'm just here to. Look, we're, uh, uh, it's a small and intimate event, so uh, we, can, we can sort things out as they, as they happen. Minister, um, we were just presented with findings of a new power atlas by the ECFR, uh, saying, among many other things, uh, that it's not only economic and military means anymore uh, that shape global relations uh, and power uh, in, in the world, but also people. Uh, that is, seems very topical when it comes to what the EU experiences at the moment. Uh, at the border with, with Belarus. Is that something um, that the EU and maybe even the West, let me start with that, has the adequate uh, means and has adequate answers to, or is there, uh, is there a need for a more structural change to the EU's own foreign policy? And uh, voila, let me kick it off with that. Thank you, Florian. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the European Council of Foreign Relations for this invitation today to discuss the role of, of the EU that plays today in, in, in the world. I will have to leave soon, and I'm, I'm glad, and, and I thank you for starting sharp because I have to join the President in the Summit of the Democracies uh, in, in a few moments. Definitely, the European Union has to decide today what uh, is its role in the world, what is its role in every part of the world, and what we consider threats and what's our potential. And in order to do that, we need also to reflect if we have the right capacity to play the role that we want to play and to face the different threats. What we are seeing today in Belarus, it's clearly a hybrid attack. It's the political use of irregular migration using human beings and their suffering to challenge the European Union. Spain is fully supporting Poland and all the other neighboring countries of uh, Belarus that uh, are all under pressure today. We are external border of the European Union and we know very well the phenomenon of irregular migration and we see very clearly the temptation of many countries in the East but it can be tomorrow in the South, to use irregular migration as hybrid attack against the European Union. We have to reflect on that. It's not the conventional attacks, but at the same time, it's a real challenge to us. For Spain, clearly, the answer must be European. A solid, a solidar, a with solidarity of all Europeans. Today it's been Poland or the Baltic countries that are being challenged, but really it's not them, it's the whole European Union. Tomorrow it could be on our southern border, it could be to Spain, to Italy, to Greece, it wouldn't be to any of our countries in specifically, it would be to the European Union. So yes, Spain is in favor of advancing uh, in uh, European defense, and also in uh, reflecting within the European Union, and now we are with the strategic compass on the table, it's a perfect moment right before that in NATO we will have to 
do a new strategic concept to reflect also how to face those no conventional threats. Uh, what is the right forum to discuss these things? Is it foreign policy only or uh, is there uh, are there other colleagues of yours and ministers who would have a have to have a role in this because you say it's a hybrid attack of course uh, on the other hand it's actually real people who are uh, uh, well being misused probably by, by the Belarusian regime uh, but there is a migration element to this too right definitely foreign policy will be the umbrella and foreign policy will be the one giving coherence and having the global vision. The different tools that we will need, it's something that we have to design upon it, but clearly will not be only foreign policy. But foreign policy, from my point of view, must be the umbrella, must be the coherence. What we have to decide, and this must be one single European answer, is what's our position on the world and what capacities do we need? One, we Europeans have decided that we have to, we must have a high level dialogue with our natural ally, that is the United States, and see what we must do on our own and what we can do jointly. Is there, that brings me actually to a, a broader point that we want to discuss in this, uh, well, uh, in the next hour with, with our guests. Um, the classic uh, uh, power balance in, in this world is, is, has become shaky a little bit. Uh, you see a new antagonism between the United States, you mentioned, and China, uh, 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 another big country. Um, is there, can you actually afford to put it bluntly, to antagonize China uh, by siding 100% um, with the United States in the conflict between the two? Well, China today has raised very clearly as uh, an international uh, power with uh, new dimensions in international politics. It's, uh, their interest is truly global. Alil embraces all areas of power that goes from economy to defense and technology. We see China very present today in Africa and in Latin America. All that should spur us Europeans to mobilize our energy to better connect Europe with all different regions in the world. The United States influence remains extraordinary in areas uh, that remain uh, close to innovation, uh, creativity, uh, capacities, and the pivotal position of the United States in the world is very clear whether we look at technology, military issues, and we share values with uh, the United States. But as I said at the very beginning, and I will repeat it once again, the historical moment in which we are is not that of choosing one or the other or deciding if we are going to go with the United States in this field or not in this other field. The first reflection that we have to do on our own Europeans is what must be our position on our own, where we want to stand in the world, in which regions we want to be involved. Do we want to be involved in all of them? Do we want only to be involved in the closest scenarios? Once we have decided that, and that's why we need this reflection with the strategic compass, what are the capacities we need? And then, yes, of course, we will have a high level dialogue with the United States because the United States remain our natural ally. Concerning China, we have to decide when China, it will be a challenge for Europe and when China can be a partner for Europe. And those must be autonomous decisions that the Europeans, we must have on our own. Is there, are there, uh, I know Minister, because you have to leave us as, as you said, are there any pressing questions in the room already for the Minister, uh, just to avoid that we, uh, that he has to go without you having a chance to, to ask him questions, then please, uh, just raise a hand or, or, or take the microphone that as a, as a further housekeeping uh, remark. Ivan, I saw that you uh, uh, made a lot of notes on, on what the minister said. Would you like to, uh, can I prompt you for a first uh, intervention, for a first answer uh, or even question? No, it's very much a question because I do believe one thing that was also very much strengthened by the pandemic is that we think in terms of projections. 
This is not how powerful we are today, but how powerful you are going to be tomorrow. In a certain way, when you try basically to deal with other countries, you can, and projections could be wrong, but this is what is driving our imagination. So from this point of view, one of the challenges of Europe, which I see is that, of course, our role is going to decline when it comes to the size of population. It's going to decline because of our size of the global GDP, because we have been very big before. How you believe that Europe should deal with this? The idea of a shrinking numbers when it comes to the global imagination of power and basically the future of the world. I would approach the, the issue of power for European Union and for Europe in two different scenarios. One, it would be hard power, the capacities we need, both for conventional threat or for non-conventional threat. That is not so much for me an issue of how we want to project ourselves, but how do we want to protect our people from external threats. And that's something that we need to do autonomously, that reflection. But on our projection towards the future, whether we could be shrinking in population, for instance, there is one thing in which European Union is absolutely unique in uh, the world, is this way of showing uh, human rights, democracy, rule of law. Uh, in that sense, European Union is a superpower, and those are the ingredients, respect of human rights, uh, advancing rule of law and democracy that will make the world stable. If you take development cooperation, it's exactly the same thing. If you take the European Union institution plus the uh, member states, we have more than 50% of the development aid in the world. That uh, spirit of solidarity of Europe, those will be areas in which the projection of the European Union will remain strong in the future and sure, wherever it happens. What we have to decide today is in which regions we want to make the difference and in, in even uh, in front of traditional conventional threats and what are the capacities that we need for. That's the challenge that we have today, right today, on the table. When you, when you speak about uh, the European values and the rule of law, and that is uh, something that the EU uh, might even uh, export or be able to uh, convey, uh, in its relations with other people, uh, that there are, of course, a few occasions where you, uh, now I start again, there is a discussion among colleagues of yours at the moment, and I would be interested uh, in whether you had uh, developed a position already on whether um, to boycott or not diplomatically boycott, I mean, the Olympic Winter Games in China over uh, what happened, over what happened there. Is that something um, that Europe should do? Is that something where Europe could actually or should actually develop a common position uh, on that? And what is your personal view on, on the question? Uh, the, I will not be able to answer more questions because I will have to leave to go to attend the, the summit. We have a Council of Foreign Affairs uh, next Monday in Brussels, and I'm sure that we will discuss many topics that will be uh, among uh, the topics that we will share with the different colleagues. Uh, I will not talk on behalf of Europe on, on a current uh, issue uh, such as that. Uh, so we'll see uh, what will be the common sense uh, around the table. What's your... And thank you, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very sorry not to be able to remain longer. But talking about democracy, I'm just going to attend the Summit of Democracies. So it's for the good cause that I have to leave. Of course. <laughs> thanks, for, thank you. thanks for being here, Minister, and thank you for uh, the discussion. Um, Commissioner Urpilainen, uh, welcome to our panel here. It's a half virtual, half uh, physical panel here in Berlin with Ivan Krastev, who you know. Uh, so welcome and thank you for, for joining. Um, I wanted, actually, I, when I introduced you to uh, the audience here before, uh, I just said that you had a moment of stardom of, of late uh, in the European Commission with, uh, with your new initiative, the Global Gateway Initiative, and um, I wanted to, to kick it off um, by asking you 
uh, maybe a little bit too flattery question, but um, in the press the days after, I saw only praise and not much criticism. Uh, that leads me to, to the question, why uh, did it take so long to come up with a strategy that is apparently, uh, apparently well-received across European countries and in Brussels? Thanks a lot uh, for this opportunity to participate and good afternoon to Berlin. Hopefully you can hear me because I had some difficulties in the beginning to, to hear, hear you. But um, I wanted to start by, by thanking because I had an honor uh, to become a member of the ECFR Council this year. This is a new position for me. And of course, it's, it's a great pleasure to participate in the annual uh, Council today. Um, if you allow me, Florian, I would make a short introduction. And then after that, I would also come back to your question, if that's fine for you. Because um, I wanted to comment very shortly on the uh, ECFR Power Atlas, which was published uh, today, I understood. And I think it actually is making a very valid point. So flows of goods, data, money, and people, they are definitely changing international relations. New independencies are changing also the power balances. And I think the key words are responsiveness, but also flexibility. For example, uh, we as Europe are allied with the US and challenged by China and Russia. At the same time, we do not sit in total harmony with the US administration or in total opposition to that of China or Russia. So we need to engage with our rivals on climate, on COVID and on the SDGs, so Agenda 2030. And I would like to trace, uh, raise three points on how is the EU adapting to this new geopolitical reality in my field of uh, aid and international partnerships. And I have three messages. The first one is partnership focus, the second one is global gateway strategy, which you referred to already. And the third one is Team Europe approach. So first, the way the EU works on development finance is definitely changing. And I have to say that we, we, can, we have been witnessing a change of paradigm already in the beginning of, 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 um, of mandate of this commission. So we rather refer to international cooperation and partnerships than aid or donor recipient relationship. So we look at equal partnerships on shared goals. And I want results, I personally as a commissioner, I want results that serve EU interests. And I'm not apologizing for promoting EU priorities such as Green Deal, digital or democratic. In doing so, I make sure that our priorities are, of course, in line with multilaterally agreed sustainable development goals and also at the Paris Agreement. Our geopolitics means good for the EU, but also good for the world. My second point, um, so as you said, the Commission announced uh, last week its new global connectivity strategy which is called Global Gateway. So it is also based on coherence between our European and global agendas. We will promote green and digital transitions at the global level. You know that the first two years of this commission, we have been mainly been in the middle of the COVID crisis. But of course we have been fighting the crisis but in, in addition to that we have been very much promoting green and digital transitions within the europe we do that for instance through the next generation eu and these uh, national recovery plans so now we are at the stage where we try to promote this twin transition also at the global scale so that we want to support green and digital transitions in our partner countries and we seek a pro to promote a global connectivity model in line with the democratic values. And we call it ethical strategy because our infrastructure projects, they do not create unsustainable debt 
or unwanted dependencies. And this is important for us. We don't want to create dependencies, neither increase debt. So we are transparent on our objectives, but also on, on mutual benefits. And this does distinguish our global gateway partnership from other initiatives, such as the Chinese Belt and Road. So our goal is not to compete with China. It's not against China, but we are offering a positive choice for global infrastructure de development with highest standards. And of course, Global Gateway is the EU's contribution to the wider G7 agenda to build back better. In these efforts, we see convergence with like-minded partners like the US. And just before this event, I had a meeting with Australian foreign minister uh, with whom I had an opportunity also to discuss on, on Global Gateway. And my final point, so uh, I think my one of my main messages today is that uh, we have really changed the way we do things. By adopting Team Europe approach, uh, this uh, new concept, we pool resources and we pool tools with member states, but also with the European development finance institutions. And I personally think that this Team Europe is our way of increasing our impact in partner countries and also in different regions. And Team Europe gives also hope of greater leverage in multilateral fora, in which we have seen growing, of course, for instance, China's influence. So defending human rights and three pillars of sustainable development definitely need a European uh, voice. So um, I hope that I was able to, to answer your question uh, as well. Commissioner, is there, uh, uh, you presented, the, the Commission presented the, the Global Gateway Strategy and this week actually um, it presented a new, um, uh, a new toolbox for uh, anti uh, uh, and the anti-coercion instrument uh, this week. Is it uh, correct to observe that the, the European Commission uh, uh, developed a more uh, assertive, let me say, approach to international relations uh, generally, or does that, in your view, have nothing to do with each other? Uh, I don't personally see a clear link between these two uh, to communications or strategies. But I fully agree with you that, of course, we need to be more assertive and we need to be more active. And, and I think this was definitely one of the priorities for the Bond Alliance Commission, that we want to have global, we want to have the European Union to, to more stronger role in the world. So we want to be geopolitical commission. And I think this global Gateway strategy we adopted last week is concretely that in action, so that the, it's a geopolitical commission in action. But of course, in order to succeed, we need to work together with the member states. And, and that's why this Team Europe concept is so important, because we have limited resources when it comes to European Union budget. And that's why we need to pool resources and pool also expertise uh, together with the member states and also the, uh, with their financial institutions. And would you say that the Team Europe approach uh, has worked very well when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, the, the, the vaccination campaigns globally against, against the coronavirus? And I think it has. And actually, if we look at, uh, because, you know, we decided to choose multilateral facility in order to deliver vaccines. So uh, we created COVAX and we have been the biggest donor to COVAX. So Team Europe had, have, uh, has contributed over 3 billion euros to COVAX facility. Uh, we have uh, shared our member states, they have shared nearly 350 million doses. And, 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 and the biggest uh, part of this uh, doses goes to COVAX. Of course, there are also bilateral donations. And also, if we look at the export, because of course, I mean, uh, we have been also exported 1.4 billion, do uh, billion doses from Europe to elsewhere. So, I mean, we have taken responsibility when it comes to the uh, global fight against COVID-19 
But at the same time, I want to underline that more has to be done. Because, of course, if you look at the figures in Africa, 6% of the citizens are fully vaccinated. It's not enough. And that's why, of course, we need to do more. And there is a political commitment to share 700 million doses by the mid of next year. So uh, we are working on that. Uh, there are calls from uh, the World Health Organization included uh, to prioritize actually uh, vaccinating um, the, the global population over uh, getting third doses to people who are already double vaccinated. Is that something that you would that you would share a call that you would personally uh, uh, share? Well, I see that uh, always when you th I have been national politician nearly 20 years before I became poli uh, a commissioner. And I fully understand that uh, when you are a national politician, prime minister, finance minister, um, me member of government, your main responsibility, of course, is always take care of your own citizens. That's the you know, priority number one. But I think if, if, if we look at the facts, the European Union has, since the beginning, not only the Commission, but also the member states, really taken responsibility also on the global response to COVID-19. In the beginning of the crisis, we created this global response package uh, with an amount of 46 billion euros, through which we really redirected our funding to our partner countries so that, that they could really, you know, uh, be able to, to address COVID-19 crisis. What was it? It was humanitarian assistance. It was strengthening the healthcare system, it, it, but it was also to help to mitigate the social economic consequences of the crisis. So since the beginning of the crisis, we have done a lot. When it comes to vaccines, I think now everybody is uh, very concerned when it comes to Omicron and, and what, are the, you know, what are the facts relating to that. We don't know all the facts yet. So I think it's important that we are able to raise the vaccination rate within the Europe, and it's important that we take boosters. But at the same time, of course, we also need to raise and increase the global um, global vaccination rate. 44% of the global population are vaccinated at the moment, 44%. And we have a goal to increase that to be 70% by the mid of next year. So it means that we need to share more, we need to produce more, but we also need to help our partner countries to roll out and deploy vaccines so that it's not only doses, but it's vaccination, that they are capable also to start to vaccinate people. Because we can see more and more, for instance, in Africa, that uh, even though we have been able to deliver vaccines to those countries, they are not able to vaccinate their citizens. And that's why we also need to provide support to, 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 to strengthen their healthcare systems so that they are able to really, you know, vaccinate their citizens. I would like to bring uh, you in at this point, Ivan. Uh, we've heard from the Commission about the new uh, approach of the European Commission to use uh, geopolitics also for uh, economic gain and vice versa, and this new approach to, uh, to, to development uh, cooperation um, and all. Um, and uh, she said it's not against, against China, but a question to you. Um, is there, uh, we've seen that uh, authorit authoritarian, uh, authoritarian regimes um, uh, seem more uh, at ease with using uh, their uh, p uh, techniques like this and, and the infrastructure and, and finances uh, and economic pressure uh, for, their, for their own interests than, um, than democratic countries. Is that something um, that can be changed and is that a wise approach, would you say, what, what we're seeing at the moment? No, listen, uh, to be absolutely honest, it's not so much about democratic countries versus authoritarian countries. There was a period in which democratic countries were very successful building infrastructure. And by the way, Germany and Marshall Plan is a great example of the fact that democratic countries can be very successful. We are talking about something totally different. Uh, in a certain way, what happened during the COVID is that uh, some of the states, China, Russia being examples, they really decided to make this a very important diplomatic initiative. So when you're going to have a vaccine arriving, for example, in Serbia, they're going to be basically the Russian ambassador meeting the vaccines. 
Uh, well, in the case of the European Union, you don't have this type of a strategy. And now when you look at basically opinion polls, you're going to see that some of these countries basically benefited and benefited regardless of the fact that, for example, more vaccines came from Europe, the fact that Europe, unlike the United States, even in the most difficult moment, never closed its borders, basically vaccines have been exported all the time. Simply, it's much easier for the nation states to do it. Mm -hmm. And particularly, it's much more e easier to do it because basically it comes as a package of a foreign policy influence in general. And I do believe this is one of the things that probably uh, should be also uh, decided uh, uh, by the Commission, and this is the visibility of European aid. Uh, this was a lot of studies being done, particularly in the Western Balkans. When you're going to ask Serbs uh, who is the country that basically is aiding most your country, you're going to have 60% claiming that this was Russia, while basically the figures are totally different. It is 70% being money coming from the European Union. And on one level, of course, you easily can blame it on local politics, but on the other side is that, in a certain way, European Union does not know to, what to do with its flag when it comes to international aid. And I do believe this is one of the issues that to be discussed seriously. Commissioner, I remember that uh, under the Juncker Commission that there was an, uh, I mean, there was a will at least, and maybe not a formal initiative, to put the EU flag on more uh, on, on international aid and on uh, and on on goods that were delivered to uh, to countries in need. Is it something that is that is still? Uh, would you agree with Ivan Krastev is the, the short question? Well, I, I agree with him that uh, it's always easier to get the visibility uh, when, uh, when, when there are, you know, few uh, actors. I mean, that uh, if you think about the European Union, it's the member state, it's a, a union of 27 member states. And of course, uh, I mean, uh, when, when we're talking about uh, Team Europe, so then we are talking about, of course, the Commission and the Union, but also the member states working together. And I personally think, think that when it comes to the visibility, this Team Europe approach is definitely a way to increase the visibility on the ground. Because now we try to really work together on the ground at, at our uh, partner country level, but then also pool resources and pool tools so that, uh, that, you know, our partners can also recognize that, okay, this European Union is a team, it's a one team playing to the one uh, direction. And I think, unfortunately, this has not been the case. Uh, if we look at, you know, back in the history, uh, we have uh, several examples where many of our member states have been active, not only in Africa, also in Asia, and sometimes even competing each other and you know not really have that kind of coordination between the member states neither with between the commission so this is uh, this is something we really really try to change now through this team europe approach it started uh, when we created this team europe approach um, uh, address COVID-19 crisis. I would say that if something positive is created by the COVID-19, it is this Team Europe approach. But now we are using that also in our uh, programming exercise where we are directing our uh, external funding to the different regions, to the different countries, to different policy priorities. So first time ever, we did that exercise together with the member states by pooling resources defining at the country level what are the policy priorities and also creating the so-called Team Europe initiatives, which are also co-funded and financed together with the member states. So I, I, I really believe that this new concept uh, is, is a way to strengthen our vis visibility. Uh, but of course, I mean, much depends on their work on the ground. So it's easy to create concepts here in Brussels. I think it's not that uh, uh, difficult to convince the member states in their capitals to be part of this approach. But the real challenge is, of course, on the ground. How to motivate our delegations, our embassies really to work as a team. And, um, uh, and another, another point I wanted to make relating to vaccines and, and also this example uh, made by China or relating to China. Uh, of course, I mean, always when you work through the multilateral system like this COVAX is, it's more difficult 
to get visibility for one donor. So, I mean, in this case, even though we have been really, you know, uh, contributed financially, but also shared doses to COVAX, we, we are struggling with the visibility for our contribution because we are only, of course, uh, there are several other donors uh, who are also contributing to COVAX. So that's why this is a, this is a challenge we need to tackle. And, and of course, we are working on that all the time. At least, uh, how should I put it? Uh, Russia seems to have the opposite problem and they're very good at, uh, at communicating about the Russian vaccine, but not so good at uh, delivering the, uh, the, the, proper, the proper thing. And when you uh, remember that even European countries, uh, some European countries, including Austria uh, and some of the German states here, Bavaria at least, uh, were interested in, in Sputnik doses when it was a bit tight. Uh, I haven't heard. Uh, I haven't heard from any of them uh, of late about the experiences with it because it never arrived. But that's just as a as a remark. I would like to open the discussion up at this point to the audience, both uh, online. Uh, I'm seeing your questions here and and here in the room. So if there are questions, please just raise your hand and take the microphone. Can I make a short comment yes, while people are coming? And this is one of the problems of Europe is that from time to time, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, we had slightly wrong idea how we are seen from outside. We are so much assured in the benevolent view that we have about ourselves being shared by everybody else. As a result of it, you believe we don't need to communicate. We don't not do to this and that because, and this is true about climate policies. This is true about basically the fact that we are the biggest uh, donor of international aid and others. Uh, but it does not always need to be the case. And I do believe one of the story of all this kind of a power is that probably European Union should include much more curiosity about how others really see us. And they does not need to see it's right. It could be a very distorted version. It could be, by the way, shaped by other people and other actors. But to live with the idea that we are perceived as a providers of public good, or all others are perceived basically as going for their own interests, it's not always the case. And because there was here talk a lot of about maps. Listen, the first maps in the world have been drawings of a travelers. And from this point of view, if you go to different and travel to different places in the world and try to see how European Union is commented and so on, you're going to see that many things that for us basically are obvious are not particularly obvious to the people, including the case of uh, basically the Russian vaccines. And I agree very much. Basically, the failure of the Russians to deliver to places like Argentina and others is amazing in a certain way. Uh, but then basically, ECFR made a paper doing a polling in this same Serbia saying, if you're going to get vaccinated, with which kind of a vaccine you're going to do it? Because Serbia was one of the very few places where you have the Pfizer vaccine, but also basically you have the Russian vaccine and you have the Chinese. And contrary to our intuition, which by the way is supported by scientific facts, that the Western vaccines were doing better, simply this is data on this, uh, basically the Chinese and the Russian vaccines were perceived as more desirable by the Serbs themselves. And I do believe this idea about perceptions, and this has a lot to do with power. Power is relational. It's not something that basically can be easily measured. Power is also in the eyes of the beholder, like beauty. So from this point of view, having the right view of how others view it, in my view, is going to be very helpful uh, from time to time when we're shaping our policies. I have a question here in the, in the second row. First, the lady, and then you. You were first. Just take the microphone here. Or don't take it, but... <laughs> um, I would like to ask about a certain ambiguity and go back uh, to the migration subject. Namely, it's very important that uh, Europe have challenges the migration problem that we have on the eastern border right now. But I would like to, you, you to elaborate a little bit on the following ambiguity. Right now, the country which is being there dealing with the crisis caused by Alexander Lukashenko is an illiberal regime which is trampling on the rule of law. So here we have the tension between the necessity to protect European borders and to protect liberal democracies that are within the European Union. And at the same time, we have a country on which we depend, which is my country, by the way, Poland, 
which tramples on the rule of law. Could you please elaborate a little bit about it? I think that was for you, Commissioner, also. I, I think I had some difficulties to, to, to hear the beginning of, of her intervention, but I heard the last, uh, last point relating to, to Poland and, and the rule of law. For me, as a commissioner, uh, the European Union is a community of values. I think that's the, the, the main part of DNA of the European Union. And that's why I think that it's so important that all the member states are also respecting those values because they knew that those this is the community of values when they decided to join this community. So uh, I think, uh, of course, being a responsible for international cooperation uh, with our partner countries, I think also when it comes to the coherency and consistency and, 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 and also credibility in our international cooperation, it's important that, you know, as a union, we are able to really show and, and, and prove that, uh, that we respect not only the rules, which are, I'm coming from Finland, and you know that Finns are also uh, always <laughs> stick to the rules, but, uh, but uh, as well as rules, uh, of course, we also need to stick to the values. The question, uh, uh, though, was a bit different than here, uh, and the que I, I can, uh, let me put it that way, the question was um, whether the Polish government is being given a free pass, basically, at the moment, uh, and, and the Commission uh, and other European governments look the other way um, uh, when it comes to, their, uh, to, to the rule of law in Poland, um, because uh, the, the, the situation at the border uh, is is being taken as the only thing that people are uh, interested at at the moment in Poland. Is there is there that ambiguity? Is there a little conflict uh, in there for you? I think when it comes to the border of Belarus, of course, I mean, the European Union has been very united. Uh, we want to definitely support our members. But at the same time, we have been also providing uh, humanitarian assistance, for instance, to the people uh, uh, who are at the moment and, and, and who were not, uh, because many are, have been returned to their country of origin. But, uh, you know, in the middle of the crisis, also we provided a lot of humanitarian assistance to the people who are suffering uh, at the border. So I think um, uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, that uh, you know, we somehow close our eyes to, to the difficulties uh, when it comes to the rule of law or some other uh, ongoing discussions with the Polish government. But I think here we, are, we were poorly focusing on the crisis. And uh, I think it's also the strength of the European Union that we were able to work uh, very united and, and, and also try to solve the conflict and, and try to also influence so and make an impact so that uh, people don't travel to that region anymore. And I think here, for instance, the role of the Commission and my colleagues were very crucial when they convinced the countries of origin not to start or, or, or continue the flights uh, from their capitals to Minsk. So I think the Commission was very active, but also the unanimity. I mean, the, 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 the way we worked uh, and, 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 and the unitedness was, uh, of course, the important part of the uh, approach, which has been, until now at least, quite successful, because now uh, the situation has, has been more stable. I do believe that there is something slightly also deeper going here. Uh, the attractiveness of the European Union was its soft power, but basically in a profound way, with the migration, the European Union is terrified by its own attractiveness. Because, of course, uh, European soft power, in our view, was others wanted to be like us. But the attractiveness of the EU is also others wanted to come to live with us. And from this point of view, the Polish case is not the first one in which basically immigration comes. Turkish-Greek relations and others have been also there. And I do believe that uh, on a certain way, uh, uh, when uh, uh, 
basically was uh, the question coming from Carolina. Listen, Carolina, even countries that have a problem with the rule of law can have a legitimate security concerns. It's not the problem, and I do believe that the Commission and the EU are right to tell to the Polish people, we care about your sovereignty, about basically your territorial integrity, and we're not going to allow others to blackmail you. On the other side, the European Union didn't start giving money back to Poland. Nevertheless, that they have a security concern. So from this point of view, trying to distinguish between the problems within the union and the outside of the union, in my view, is critically important because part of the play of the governments like the Polish one is to convince their own people, Brussels does not care about you. They don't care what is happening on your border. Basically, they care only about their borders. So from this point of view, for me at least, the way the European Union was dealing with uh, the, the crisis on the uh, polish belarusian border was much more fight for the soul of the Polish society, trying to convince them we are making distinction between your legitimate security concerns and the illegitimate interest of your government to change the nature of the regime, basically, by the very fact that you are staying in the European Union. Second question, please. As a soldier from Austria, I would confirm what you said about the Sputnik, but I want to come back to, to Africa and to what uh, Jutta Oppelaiden said. Uh, one very specific question and one general one. The one specific is about South Africa now with Omicron. Okay. South Africa feels itself punished because they made very clear and sent the message about the Omicron variation. So, of course, I can understand that you have to stop uh, traveling, go, uh, coming and, and going to South Africa. But can one help now South Africa in that very specific situation to have not the, f the feeling that they are punished for being transparent and openly? And the second question, also in connection with vaccination, I think the, the issue is, of course, that many of the vaccines are produced outside Africa. It's not only about, uh, about uh, the COVID vaccination, but other vaccination. The big problem of epidemics is in, pandemics is in Africa, but nearly no vaccination and many other medicines are not produced in Africa. So maybe the European Union, and as it is your, your favorite subject, Jutta, we could support and put some pressure on, on uh, international companies, not only to produce in the US and to produce in Europe and China and India, but also in Africa. That would be a big uh, step forward for the health situation in Africa. Thank you. If you, I don't know, we, we, uh, if you want to, uh, my question was whether you wanted to, to comment or have an answer to uh, the remark, and one was actually uh, a suggestion or a question. Isn't that something that you could uh, pursue? Yeah, I think I, I, I was able to, to, to hear uh, the questions. So first, when it comes to South Africa, yes, I, in a way, I, 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 I understand their feeling that, that uh, you know they were uh, successful. Their researchers were capable to find this new variant. They were transparent with it, and then of course they feel that uh, not only the European Union countries but also the UK, the US, decided to uh, impose the travel restrictions uh, towards Southern African countries. So um, I feel uh, feel them, and I, I I can understand their feeling. Uh, on the other hand, of course, from the EU perspective, I think uh, the de decision we took was um, uh, it was understandable. Uh, we want to thank South Africa to being so transparent, and of course, we both also want to congratulate their re researchers uh, because they found this uh, new variant. Um, my personal wish is that we are able to ease or lift the travel restriction uh, rest restrictions as soon as possible hopefully uh, uh already tomorrow when i know that there is this uh, meeting among the member states so that uh you know then with the pcr test for instance uh our tourists could then travel back to southern africa because this is the high season in in that region and of course those countries are 
very dependent on the tourism. So from that perspective, also uh, the consequences to their economies uh, are, are very negative. And, and then, of course, there are many other ways how we are also supporting South Africa and South African countries through our programming exercise, but also some other concrete initiatives, which we try to also push uh, forward. And actually, one of them is uh, relating to vaccine production. Because you were completely right, Africa imports 99% of the vaccines it uses and 94% of the medicines uh, it uses. So uh, really, uh, we need to, in order to strengthen the resilience of, of Africa, we need to uh, increase vaccine and medicine production in Africa for Africa. And that's why we launch an initiative this is a Team Europe initiative, so European Commission, but also uh, some of our member states and our financial institutions are contributing to it, that we try to create uh, three regional hubs, one to Senegal, one to Rwanda, and one to South Africa, where we can really produce vaccines and medicines uh, for, for Africa. And um, the, the project is ongoing. I was personally visiting Rwanda, Kigali, and uh, witnessing a signing ceremony between Rwandan government uh, and uh, European Investment Bank. Also, BioNTech was present there. So uh, we hope that uh, next year, uh, at some point next year, we are able to start the production. So I, I think this is, um, this is an important initiative for whole Africa. And of course, uh, the European Union is very much also financing the, this initiative. So in total, we are providing 1 billion euros support to this initiative. This. If you ask people that what they have learned, they have learned that European Union was the one defending the intellectual rights on the vaccines, while others, including the Americans, were pushing for. And I know it's much more complex, and I know that particularly with this difficult much more new generation of vaccines it's not enough to have the license producing it is very difficult but talking again about basically the external perception we were perceived as basically the one trying to keep the intellectual rights while all others were perceived as being very generous to africa and to the other part of the world i can add a, a question here uh, from from anthony dworkin uh, Commissioner, you talked about the importance of taking a partnership rather than an aid and an aid donor approach. Uh, but on vaccines, it seems, it seems we are still in the perspective of donating doses and money. This is, of course, better than nothing, but many Africans want something more to have IP restrictions, as, as you just said, lifted, and to have transfer of technology and expertise so they can make their own vaccines. Uh, question, shouldn't the EU be doing more to support this? Yeah, Even more. this is actually... Yes, this is what we are doing. And um, uh, we launched this initiative in the beginning of this year. And uh, this is a part of the um, a package we are preparing for the AU-EU summit. So you know that there will be African Union, European Union summit in February in Brussels. And now, of course, we are preparing uh, concrete deliverables for that summit. And of course, this ma vaccine manufacturing initiative is part of that package. But as I say, there is a political commitment of um, 1 billion euros to be used to this initiative. And the idea is, in the beginning, create three, three regional hubs. Uh, for ma vaccine manufacturing production and, and also med not only vaccine, but uh, also um, medicines. And then I think, uh, and I have noticed that there are many other countries who are very, in very much uh, willing to join to this initiative. So let's see whether we are able to increase the figure uh, and the number of countries. But at this point, there are Senegal, Rwanda and uh, uh, and uh, South Africa, but uh, as my 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 dear fellow panelist was was just highlighting that to start vaccine production, we have noticed that within the EU during the crisis that it wasn't so easy. So I mean that's why we need to have this kind of 360 degree approach, 
uh, so that we take care of the regulatory framework, we take care of the skills that we have really people who are uh, skillful enough to work in those uh, factories and, 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 and production. Then we have to also take care of the demand side. So there are many different access, uh, aspects we need to take care of when we are you know, preparing the production in, in, in those countries. And when it comes to TRIPS waiver, the European Union has said that um, we don't we don't see that uh, that's the uh, that would solve the problem in in the short term, but of course we are always uh, willing and able to discuss about it, and that's why. For instance, we have been waiting for concrete proposals from the United States relating to that. But unfortunately, we haven't seen anything on the paper until now. So it has been a political announcement made by the US, but nothing concrete on, on that. A quick follow-up by me before I come to the next questions. You said you were uh, hoping that the, the, the travel restrictions can be lifted tomorrow. Is that, a, is that How confident are you that this will happen? Well, I think I think now we are in a completely different kind of situation because we have found Omicron almost all over the world, yep. across the world. So I think, you know, uh, from that perspective, there, there would be sense to lift the uh, travel restrictions because, I mean, Omicron is already almost in every member state. But I understand that this is a decision which has to be taken by the member states. And I think there has to be, of course, uh, conditions so that uh, maybe, you know, with the PCR test, which has to be taken before entering in the plane and maybe after immediately after 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 landing again. So this could be a one concept. Uh, which, uh, which would allow them to lift the uh, travel restrictions. But uh, this is my personal thinking, and, uh, and, and let's see what, the, what will be the outcome of the member states. Okay. I have uh, two questions here, and then we go on the other side. Please start. Thank you very much, Bader Kalegasi from uh, Istanbul and Paris. Uh, to, uh, to what extent the experience of last uh, two years helped the European Union to, to clarify the paradox between being a community of values on the one hand and also uh, uh, being in the position of uh, being obliged to protect its interests, material interests, economic interests in, in almost all these seven battlefields in a network world that the the power atlas of the ECFR very well highlights and illustrates uh, uh, everything from trade interest, investment interest, technology, uh, digital sovereignty, immigration, security, name it. You know, uh, uh, the transnational or even transcontinental impact of the Green Deal. You know, on all that, sometimes there is certainly a dilemma. Does the European Union is in now in the position? Is, is it in the position of uh, elaborating a more lucidity, maybe a doctrine, to handle this paradox, or is it still better to leave it to the practice and to manage the ambiguities? Uh, is there any changes at side? Thank you. Would you like to start? Uh, I'll start with something that, at least in my view, is uh, obvious, that if you see the three previous crises, for example, the terrorist uh, crisis and basically response to terrorism in Western Europe, and then the economic crisis, the global financial crisis, and then the migration crisis, and you see the European responses to this, as a result of COVID, I do believe all three have been dramatically revisited. Uh, as a response to the terrorist threat, unlike in the United States, and very much because of the 9-11, Europeans were very, very kind of a skeptical about mass surveillance, uh, basically any intrusion on the rights. Now, because of a totally different nature of the COVID crisis, you can see that some of the kind of a restrictions that were not going to be welcome back then have been very much allowed. When you go to economic policies, particularly in this city, the major story after financial crisis was fiscal discipline. And now if you see after this crisis, also in this city, you're going to see that economic response is very different by the same players. And honestly speaking about migration crisis, if on the economic policies basically Europe has moved to the south, 
on the migration crisis, it has moved to the east. It's not simply Poland. It was Greece before. In a certain way, at least for the moment, uh, closing of the external borders is perceived as something that is vital for the very political survival of the European Union and fear of the return of the anti-migration uh, populist parties and basically sentiments is something that scares Europe very much in different places. So from this point of view, I do believe that every crisis is redefining what is interest. But if one thing has changed, and uh, I see uh, Thomas Bagger because we have been uh, 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 joking about this not particularly successful metaphor of mine, but European Union has been very much turned from a missionary into a monastery because you're very much about trying to export your values, and now it's very much trying to protect them and not allow others to transform you. And this is very much something that probably has happened in the last two or three years, at least this is my take, which could be a very wrong one. Would you like to continue? And then you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a rather different subject, Commissioner. Um, uh, the EU, uh, for the EU, the Balkans is an important area. Um, we are the major uh, donor there. Uh, in particular, we are the major donor in Serbia. I don't get the impression over the, quite a long period, a lot, a lot of aid has been given, I don't get the impression that this has either brought positive change in Serbia um, or anything in the way of gratitude from Serbia. Do you think that that's good? bad, that we should do something different? I, I don't have an answer myself, um, but perhaps we ought to think about it. Is yours actually related or? Well, just but let's collect a little bit and then, and then we give the commissioner and, and even cast of time to. Uh, Nikola Dimitrov from North Macedonia. And I promise I won't bring the Western Balkans into every <laughs> session. But the title of this session, uh, Geopolitics, uh, EU's Relative Global Power, reminded me of one subtitle in a good editorial in The Economist that says, uh, if EU uh, wants to be a global power, it should be a local one first, referring to a region that is in its geography, surrounded by member states, a region where it has the maximum leverage in terms of trade, investment, assistance, but also, since Thessaloniki 2003, the promise of membership. So, given that the region is not in good shape uh, these last weeks and months, and that this promise is shaken, um, I'd like to ask whether uh, there is credibility in the European ambition to make a difference globally if it cannot make a difference in the Western Balkans. Thanks. Two uh, not only geographically related questions. Commissioner, would you like to, to start? Yes, I can start and actually I can... Uh leave those questions relating to Western Balkan, my, my fellow panelists, because <laughs> you know that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not responsible for, for those countries. It's my, my dear colleague, Commissioner Vareli, who is uh, responsible for, for uh, Western Balkans and, and, and also uh, neighboring, neighboring countries, so uh, our southern and eastern neighborhood countries. Uh, I think, you know, the, the first question relating to our values and also our own economic interests. I have to say that as a former finance minister of Finland, I don't, I don't, I don't really see the, uh, uh, that these two could somehow uh, compete each other. So that for me, they go hand in hand. I mean, we are promoting certain values but at the same time, of course, we are also driving our own economic interests. And um, for instance, if you think about the global gateway, so we tried to boost new investments around the world up to 300 billion euros. It's a huge amount of money. But those investments will be based on our values. And it will be also based on our uh, 
high standards when it comes to environment or social standards. And this is our concept in a way. This is what we believe in in Europe. And this is what we try to promote also globally. We are very transparent with it. So we don't hide anything. We are telling very openly and transparently that these are the values. These are in a way the conditions which are linked to our investment. And then we offer that to our partner countries and then they can choose whether they want to co-finance uh, co co or, or be partners in, in these uh, investments. Of course, we also have our economic interest because we also want to promote our European companies to, to invest in, in our partner countries in order to also uh, achieve those political priorities we have set uh, to these investments, like green transition and, and di digital transition. But in general, I would like to say that, um, and this was something which came up earlier in, in this panel discussion, that the European Union, I mean, Team Europe, is, <laughs> is the biggest donor when it comes to the ODA, Official Development Assistance. We are still biggest investor, uh, biggest trade partner, for instance, in Africa, if we look at the figures. But I think from my perspective, especially if you think about the ODA and our financial contribution to several, several multilateral institutions and agencies, I think until now we have acted more like payer, but not player. And this is something what we really try to change now, that of course we are willing to provide our financial support to multilateral uh, institutions and organizations, also to our partner countries. But we also have some conditions and those conditions has to be met if they want to receive our uh, financial uh, assistance. And I think it's, um, it's, uh, it's difficult because in a way we feel that uh, this is also a question of identity, who we are, what are our obligations, what are our duties in this international fora. But I personally think that that we should be more and more also player and not only payer uh, when it comes to international cooperation and international partnerships. With this, I want to thanks, uh, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to participate. And unfortunately, now I, I need to move to my uh, next event, which will start in five minutes. Uh, one last question from me. What are your? Uh, we're here in Berlin, where yesterday we had uh, we saw uh, the new German government take in office. What is your biggest hope uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the, the new German government and to the question that we discuss here, uh, the, Europe, uh, the, the EU's relative uh, global power uh, uh, and strategic autonomy and uh, a more assertive approach to international relations? Do you think? Um, this is a good, uh, it, I mean, what's your expectations towards the German government is the question. My expectations are, are positive, are, are very high also, because I think that uh, until now, German has been a very active Team Europe player, so part of our Team Europe approach. And of course, I hope that the new government will continue in, in, uh, in, in it, so that it will be actively part of our Team Europe initiatives around the world, also when it comes to Global Gateway. Um, and then, of course, I also hope that uh, that the new government will support us in, in this um, multilateral approach, because I think uh, we have seen that there are also superpowers in this world who are questioning the role of the multilateralism. And I think uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, strength and the United Nations or strength and other multilateral organizations, we definitely need also support of new government and, and Germany. But we will, um, I'm looking forward to meeting them in G7 meeting in the UK during the weekend. The new one foreign very last question. Will... One very last question. The, the new Chancellor Olaf Scholz was very proud that all the security and foreign affairs and development cooperation portfolios are in female hands in his new government. Is that something uh, that gives you, what, what does the change? I'm delighted about it. Of course, I'm, 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 I'm woman. I was the first finance, the female finance minister of Finland. And at that time, I get to know uh, Olaf Scholz himself. Uh, he was the mayor of Hamburg at that time. 
So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting uh, the new foreign minister, but also the new developing minister in, in, in UK during the weekend. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I know you have to Thanks run to another thing. Thanks for joining us here and for participating in, in the panel debate. And I think, uh, Eva, maybe the two of us wrap it up uh, here. There's a question open um, that has not been answered yet about the Western Balkans. Uh, if you want to, to say a word on that, but also to you, uh, well, I'll ask my last question to you, then after you. Uh, said no, something about I, I'll try to be very blunt about this, because I do believe that the European Union put itself in a kind of a self-defeating position in the Balkans. We continue as if the promise of enlargement is still real. The local players don't buy it like this. I mean in a horizon of 10, 12 years. And I do believe that they're right not to believe it. As a result of it, it allows them, accusing hypocrisy of the European Union, basically to use the resources and building totally different type of regimes. And for me, this is one of the biggest problems of the European Union. We are pretending that nothing has happened. Uh, we are not changing the language, we are not changing the message, so in a story is behave as if basically the world is not changing. But these people are intelligent people, they are hedging, all of them, based on the resources that they have. Uh, and as a result of it, European Union, on one level, put most resources in the, in the region, but most of these resources are used by the local leaders in order basically to hedge with other powers and try to strengthen their own positions. And from this point of view, European Union, the Western Balkans is becoming the place where the exposure of the failure of the transformative power of the European Union is the strongest. So instead of being the place European Union can prove what it can, it becomes the place where basically European weaknesses is exposed most. I do believe that some level of honesty is not going to hurt anybody. First, European Union, of course, can easily solve and help the country solve problems like Bulgaria and Macedonian issue because this is not a high mathematics. On the other side, to pretend that these countries are very much in a move of being integrated tomorrow and that the European Union is waiting for this is something that is not true. And by the way, European accessions is becoming slightly like COVID, never-ending story. Uh, and I do believe from this point of view, changing the language is not going to hurt the European Union. But for us, the moment we believe that if we're going to change the language, we believe that everything can collapse because the enlargement was the only policy on which we have agreed, we knew how it worked before. I'm not sure that this means that European Union immediately, in miraculously, is going to become very effective on the Balkans. But if you're going to change the perspective, it means that the money that you're putting are going to have a much more stronger uh, kind of an impact on the governments, on their positions, on their positioning. Otherwise, all the time, basically, European Union is losing on both sides. On one level, you're giving to governments that are using basically your money to consolidate type of regimes that you don't like. On the other side, the opposition starts to be met at the European Union saying, basically, this is your money that is keeping these governments. And thirdly, honestly speaking, for the Balkans, in order to be on the map, they can be only by creating certain trouble, because otherwise they know that immediately after some, this first level of problems are going to disappear, nobody's going to command the Balkans anymore. And this is, this is a situation in which, in my view, should be discussed in the way it is. I can imagine that this can change in five, ten years because the situation is changing, but continuing with this kind of a shirat of uh, uh, transformative power and enlargement, in my view, is against the European Union interests and against the interests of the countries in the region. I would have one last question to you as well, as we're in Berlin, uh, and as we saw, as I said before, the new government. Do you uh, believe there will be any change in the, foreign, in the approach, uh, the German approach to European foreign policy and, and uh, global and, and, well, and foreign relations? Listen, I'm one of those people who really believe that foreign policy is very much response to events. And from this point of view, the fact that basically certain government comes with a certain ideas are not enough to basically predict how they're going to behave. And saying in the beginning that maps are quite often basically the travel story of a person, for the last uh, two months I have been traveling on several places, but three of them are important to try to see where I see part of the problem that German government, but Europe in general, is going to face. I was in Serbia and I saw what I told you. Basically, we have been with Sandra Brecker. European Union is one of the resources for which basically the Serbian government plays skillfully. Then I was in Sochi and I saw that if there is uh, 
a government that does not believe in the capacity of the European Union to be a sovereign power. This is the Russian government, and this is not to be neglected, because in order to be perceived as independent source of power, others also should be ready to believe it. So from this point of view, the view of the European Union was very dismissive. And on the third level was, of course, I was in the Washington. And what I see on the American side, they said, OK, you want to be sovereign power, so please deal with all these problems with Turkey, Russia, and others, because we really want to focus on China. And we said, no, 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 uh, not like this. You should do with uh, Turkey and China, and we are going to focus basically uh, on our Indochina strategy, because the European Union does not want to be a regional power. We want to be a global power. And from this point of view, this is why I do believe it's very important for us to try to see how the world is changing, how we want to adjust to this, how we want to shape it, but not to become the victims of our own idea how the others see us. Uh, because then this can become uh, extremely destabilizing internally. Uh, if you basically believe that you have a certain transformative power that it does not have, then this is going to become destructive within the European Union, not simply on the effect of our foreign policy. I do believe that the good story about the new German government is that, in a way, it's new. Uh, no, no, and I'm saying it could because in a certain way, uh, because when you stay for a very long time if power, and I do believe this is part of the Brussels, uh, you believe that you know the answer before the question has been asked. Uh, and now they can basically allow the reality to surprise them. If they're going to be open to surprises, I do believe it's going to be great. On that note, thank you very much for joining me here. Thank you for the interest. Uh, and other people are better positioned to say what's next. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian Eder, for this excellent moderation. This was a very difficult panel uh, with a lot of hybrid moving elements. Thank you to Ivan Krastev uh, for also helping out in this. The next panel on China is going to start at quarter past. <laughs>